gentlemen, you've welcomed Rebecca before. Amin is the reason we're all here. Please welcome all three, Charles, Amin, and Rebecca, one more time. Let's get this party started. Put your hands together. Thank you. So this is going to be a sticky question. I'm going to try and keep the, the pragmatic middle ground. Here's the setting. The reason we're all here is because of a company called Jumia. A company called Jumia, no, I'm going to be straight up and down. We don't have time to pussyfoot. <laughs> if you work at that company, we're sorry. Um, it's, going to be, it's going to smart for a while, but we're hoping that the, some of the constructive input that's going to come out of this discussion will impact the vision and the purpose of your company and others like it who have in mind to emulate the progress you are engendering. Jumia is a company that is... Uh, quite famous for being the Amazon of Africa, quote unquote, the first African unicorn, quote unquote, um, Africa's largest economic success, quote unquote. Uh, sorry, these are direct quotes from the likes of TechCrunch, um, Business Insider, uh, Reuters, um, the BBC. And so one might ask, why is it so difficult for us to receive this? You have forgotten the last quote. Which is the last quote? Recently. Yeah. Fraud. Oh, yes. Jumia is a total fraud, quote unquote. Okay. That we have the fact, I mean, we have to thank the folks, the, the folks at Citroen for putting out that um, stellar piece of analysis um, for us. So from that concept, I, I want to understand why it is that issue. Help someone here who doesn't quite understand how this issue ended up as a trending theme for an entire panel at Afrobytes. How does this happen, I mean? Yeah, go ahead, man. Okay, um, first, I think that what is very interesting with this debate is that it's very easy for all of us to define what is a French startup, what is a German startup, what is a Brazilian startup, what is a Chinese startup. And there is no discussion about this, no conflict. But when it came to define what was an African startup, we started to have a civil war, on social media. So that reveals something like, hey, what's going on? Why now it's becoming a problem? Why now we have some conflicts? What does it reveal? And we found very interesting to have this debate because, you know, you talked about the media. The media are spreading our story. And I remember uh, two years ago, we had this session. The, theme, the, the, the name of Afrobytes was uh, bring back our narrative. Mm -hmm. That was the theme. That was the theme yeah. of last year. This year is uh, where do we go from here, but each time we have a, a subtitle. Because we really felt that there is something important here. Yeah. The way the media are talking about us. Uh, so, uh, yeah, okay. so that's why we have this. So, session. folks, can I just put it to you really straight and simple in framing the question for you, Rebecca? We have a soft power issue in Africa. We are typically not empowered to shape the way the world thinks of us and therefore the world, what the world believes we deserve in terms of how business ought to be done on our continent. And so from that standpoint, when you say, when you theme an entire conference, bring back our narrative, some of you think, couldn't we theme it something more pragmatic, like bring back our profit or, or eradicate co corruption or train our people so we can catch up with the rest of the world? No. By and large, a lot of the things that you think you know about the continent, especially those of you who have never actually visited long enough to know more than three people's names, is that the narrative is as good as gold. And if you have ever done a tour of Hollywood, I would challenge you to think any different. So I want to put to you, Rebecca, th at the heart of this issue is soft power, who and how it gets developed and deployed, and the agendas behind both. What do you make of us? Yeah, and I think that you know we've had this discussion. It's, it's been a simmering issue for I think a few years, um, the African startup versus startup in Africa. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it's kind of come to a head through Jumia because you know, we, the, the discussions hadn't been as intense. Um, so, so for those of you who, don't, who, who may not know Jumia, uh, Jumia is a 
I'm going to say my definition of Ju because that's part of the issue here is what is Jumia? Um, so Jumia is a rocket internet company um, that has deployed on the African continent and um, has raised 800 million US dollars and has lost $1 billion and just uh, listed on the New York Stock Exchange. So um, I think you're leaving out the part where it is arguably the greatest listing success of recent times as far as how success is framed within that world, i.e. let's create a subjective value, yeah. get people to buy into a story and pump it up. So uh, when they listed their shares, they listed at fourteen fifty. $14.50, and their shares got up to the mid-40s, which is huge. Um, I mean, much more successful than Uber. Um, their shares are back down. Yeah. I'm partly responsible for that. Yes. Um, because yes, you are. <laughs> um, yes, she is. Um, the, the, you know, the immediately after they announced the listing, um, and they, it's not the press, but they put out this narrative that, the first African startup to be listed on the New York Stock Exchange. And I said, you know what? We've, al we've let you play your game in Africa. Um, Jumia has not been a nice player. They've never been an active participant in the African tech ecosystem. They've actually been one of the, you know, using their money to crush African entrepreneurs. And an African startup, it's so hard. If anybody here, who are the entrepreneurs, startups in Africa, African startups, it is hard as hell. And so for somebody to come in as a German subsidiary and steal that work and that sweat and those tears that you've endured to be a startup and to survive and then say, oh, well, we're an African startup and we did it and here we are. We're the first ones to be listed on the stock exchange. When it's a company that's um, registered in Germany, its um, headquarters are in Dubai, and its whole de tech development team is sitting in Portugal. The only thing African about this company are its customers. And so, yeah, they have African employees, but they're working uh, in the stock rooms um, and they're working as delivery people. So I, I think that, that, that it's very frustrating to some of us. And you know, if Jumia had been a nicer company, maybe this whole debate wouldn't have come to a head with Jumia, but it would have happened. You know, because I think we've seen it over and over and over again, where you have um, people that are coming into the ecosystem and that's fine. As I said, we welcome everybody, but they can't represent us. You know, they can participate in the ecosystem, but they should not be the ecosystem. And we've seen all the money that's gone into these startups. And then we're here as African startups, and we're like, wait a minute, my, my product actually works. Theirs is still, you know, they're still trying to do a prototype and they've raised $10 million and I can't raise 100,000, you know, and, and because they don't look like me, right? They look like Silicon Valley. And they're McKinsey, uh, former McKinsey uh, uh, consultant, so of course they must know what they're doing. And of course, they've done the, the smart work of making an on-scale um, uh, argument for we should exist because we're in 16 or 27 or whatever countries. And which, is, which is, you know, and I, I just, I, like going back on this Jumia na narrative and going back and, and looking at the business itself, they have multiple businesses. It's not one Amazon, right? So let me give an example. One of their companies is called Jumia Travel, right? Jumia Travel is one of, uh, and they're, they have one in Nigeria. Formerly Jovago? Formerly Jovago. And Jumia Travel competes against Hotels NG. Who is the market leader? Hotels NG. Okay. And if you go country by country, business line by business line, you will find that it's because they've mixed up a whole bunch of lines of business that nobody else mixes up. So nobody is going to put Expedia with um, Uber and Grubhub and, and Amazon and 
um, you know, and Dice.com and um, a, a Craigslist and m put them all together and say, we're the biggest, we're the biggest that n doesn't exist anywhere else. So yeah, you've, 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 and, and so, but if you really look business by business, country by country, they are not the market leader. And so they, and they're, and, and they're killing the narrative of the African startups that are kicking their ass, excuse my language, in those markets. Yeah. And they're making it seem like, so those startups aren't gonna get the investment because they're not the market leader, even though the, in the numbers they are. Here's what's frustrating me. Folks, a company called Econet from Zimbabwe, where I'm from, is run by, founded and run by a certain Strive Masiwa, who's currently the only dollar billionaire officially, because, um, never mind. Um, uh, <laughs> who's currently the only dollar billionaire in our country. His company is a near unicorn by revenue. That never makes the headlines here. By revenue. So, I wanna ask you a question, and I'm, that's the segue here, which is, you know, I'm really trying to help people who, I wanna help people who don't understand the frustration, the ecosystem realities that we deal with as covering the space, and, and the hypocrisy of the brokenness that we are all perpetuating by sitting here and thinking this is okay, those little people should just get over it, Rebecca's got a good gig at Salesforce, she should just get over it, she's not being pragmatic enough, we need moonshots. Listen folks, under all that oversimplification is a hang of a lot of stuff we need to unpack. We don't have the time to do it, but we will sure as heck try and start here. So I'm gonna ask you, Charles, it's gonna be a tough question. You've opened up a market like Nigeria for what is easily one of the world's largest consumer, um, well, FMCG conglomerates. Um, you've also worked for one of its lar largest consumer electronics brands, the world's largest consumer ex electronics brand. Um, and I sense that you have a cr pragmatic sense of the good outside entities can do in a market they didn't they weren't spawned in, they weren't created initially to service, or even, frankly, in markets they don't really care about, if we're honest, in, in strict capitalist terms. I think it's difficult to argue the benefit of a successful deployment of a company like Procter & Gamble in a country like Nigeria. So, give us a framework for determining how you, um, understanding that, but also hearing what we all have to say and knowing the fact quite intimately, um, being on the continent yourself, how do you frame what is an African startup and what might be a healthy framework for us thinking about how to judge who gets to use that moniker and why? And also, what should come or what we should demand perhaps as an ecosystem from people who do? You know, I'm just thinking how I got into this panel. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're here now. I mean, this is a very, uh, this is a very interesting conversation, and um, you, don't have you know, to it. no, <laughs> it's 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 a very, and and I might come with different views. Uh, hit, hit us, I might, bro. I might hit come us. With That's what we need. Views. And, and you know, the, the Jumia scenario, it, it's not, it's not new. It, it gets me thinking about, even as Africans, our approach to the continent, um, our approach in terms of how. Uh, we look at these opportunities because this is a scenario of oh someone stole my cheese and and I wasn't part of the mix. Yep, there's definitely I, I am some not of that. on the on the other side of the winning table and and I'm receiving the the benefits of, of this. And time and time again, uh, we do see uh, scenarios like this um, where very interesting international companies will come in, they will discover our markets, they will see opportunities, and they probably have a model and a framework to tap into these opportunities. And sometimes we might stand and watch, and when everything takes off, then we stand again and we look and we say, oh, here goes another another tide. Mm -hmm. so, so, my, so I always kind of like bounce it back on ourselves right. in terms of, uh, you know, we talk about the narrative, but are we owning the narrative? We are now. Okay. Uh, no, we seriously. Talk about, this, no, for real. We, we talk about... They're not going to talk about this at VivaTech. We talk about the markets. <laughs> no, real talk. Okay. We it's not going to happen tomorrow. I we'll agree. Are you going to bring it in? Okay. I totally agree with you that it is a very tough market, if not the toughest, uh, you know, in the world to, to do stuff on. But, you know, when we, when we talk about owning, when we talk about the market, are we owning the market. And, yeah. and sometimes I tend to kind of like step aside, and I, I might be wrong, 
Rebecca. No, no, oh, no, no, no. I no, might no. be wrong. Say like, say, you know, say, sometimes say, I step say. aside and ask myself, you know, we, we do say, what is the African startup? But I also say, what is the African startup model? What is it that works, whether it is from a market traction or from a funding, uh, funding movement or from a talent acquisition? What is the model that, that works? And is it that these international companies get it, understand it, and do it, and then reap from it? How can we decode that and use it to our own advantage? If at all, we should classify it based on being African or being race. So, so these are these are my these are the questions that flow in my mind, and 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 you know we and it it really brings me to a, to a point to say are we rising up to the occasion, you know uh, are we really are we raising the bar and are, are we, we doing enough at, to justify yes. the fury that yes. we're raising because around? another another Jumia, another kind of Jumia is going to come again. It's well, total is market. already. In it's going to it's going to you know it's going to it's going to so so then what? Okay, so. So this We're is, already this is, five minutes over the allotted time. And this is what's going to happen. I'm going to allow this tension to just sit here. <laughs> just gonna, just, gonna just, just, let it, just let it sit like a fog on a hot day. Um, a smog on a hot day. Because here's the deal, folks. We, I, I didn't, the premise, and I, I would have I started with this, but the premise here is not that we have the answers. The premise here is that oversimplification is the enemy. There are I, I agree wholeheartedly with everything everyone has said. It is a version or a, a, um, a, a reflection of truth that is both valid and factual. It is, however, not the entire story. And to limit it to that is what I consider dangerous. And my issue, and I think what we need to start to challenge ourselves with as Africa-focused ecosystem players is how readily we allow a single narrative to influence the way we think and relate with certain markets, certain countries, and more importantly, real life people. Because just as quickly as the, the Amazon of, of Africa was announced, the greatest fraud in New York Stock Exchange IPO history related to Africa was announced just a few weeks later. And my issue with that is I was asked about neither. However, the impact of that impacts the, the viability of any hustle I might hatch, any hustle my children might hatch, and history is now cast in stone with no reversal. And guess what? No one is talking about Strive Masiwa and his near $1 billion, near $1 billion in revenue startup success a little company in Zimbabwe called Econet. Everybody is talking about Jumia. And it ends now. So ladies and gentlemen, please, one last time, help me thank. Uh, uh, help I, want, <laughs> I just want to add something yeah. about this debate. What really surprised me when we started to organize it. We launched a call. We, uh, thank you for being here. Because what really struck me is that how much people were afraid of talking about this. I was like, what? Why? People were afraid to come Why? and sit here. Mm -hmm. That's really weird. Mm -hmm. mm. Because the question was, OK, if you don't agree with the Jumia thing, you are an angry African. What? What is this? I mean, we live in France. OK, I live in France. I don't consider myself as an African startup. I could uh, uh, say that, but I'm, I am a French company with doing something about Africa, and that's cool. Mm -hmm. And there's no reason to, to change this or to bring another narrative. We need to change it. Afrobytes, the greatest African success. <laughs> but, you know, because <laughs> we, have, we, have, we have something here in France, uh, for those who are not French, they don't know that, we have something called Appellation d'origine contrôlée, which means control, uh, I don't know how to say that in English. It's, uh, yeah. The, the the origin is sort of it's like a certification for the origin of a company or product. Okay. Oh, so, so you mean I can't yeah. you mean I can't produce champagne in in Harare? Yeah. I mean that oh, you cannot I didn't know you, this. you cannot be in Nigeria. So I can't make a, a No no you cannot call this champagne. So it's not French champagne if it's made in Harare. No no you oh, okay. you you can't, you know, because we just protect. Is that how it works? And, and, and oh. everybody is okay with that. And I don't have a problem with this. It's okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
I mean, that's something that you oh, protect yeah. your economy, you protect your, you have, you have something, you know, you, you just, and the fact that we come and say, hey guys, it's okay, you are doing a great job, you create jobs, and it's cool, mm -hmm. but there is this thing that you just have to respect. Yeah. Yes, that, that th there's just this thing, we just ask you to just, because techno, they don't even have a single office in Africa, mm -hmm. and as far as I know, Techno never said we are an African startup. Mm -hmm. So it's a Chinese brand. What's the problem with this? Brand, yeah. What's why this should be a debate? Mm -hmm. Why should we point ourselves as saying that you're a traitor or you're an angry African or whatever? This whole conversation is not normal. It's weird. Yeah. And this this is all these things that really creates a kind of malaise. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, I, I feel malaise. disturbed Discomfort, by this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and and I think it's uh, it's uh, it's I always say that people never buy a product; uh, they always buy a story. We always buy a story. And you're from Nigeria. I don't know. Maybe you can correct me. But there was two company. One is Conga. Yeah. One is Junior. Yes. yes. They have basically the same website, mm -hmm. the same product, the same quality of delivery. Okay. Now, one receive a lot of money, and is that's great for them. I'm I fine, you know, they did a great job. And one is almost dying. So what would be the reaction here if you have a big player, like Blablacar, we have a big company here, Blablacar, and then you have the foreign companies that come, do the same business, and the other die. We'd be like, hey, uh, patriotism. Economic patriotism, Vive la uh, 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 intervention, that's normal, that's not weird. Every single country in the world is doing this, protecting a minimum your ecosystem, that's normal. And we shouldn't be pointed like angry people because we say it. We just want to have the same kind of stuff that others. And the fact that now mm. this is becoming a, a debate and a kind of civil war on social media. <laughs> I, I'm like not sure it's, I'm not sure I'm, I'm welcome in Nigeria at this point. I'm not sure. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah. I'm, I'm missing. But, but, yeah. but, the, but the story would have been very different uh, uh, if, you know, uh, because after when Konga died, you should just say, okay, but that's not, that's not a problem because you know what? We are an, an African startup too. So just move on to something else. Uh -huh. People never buy your product, always a story. So here's the thing, guys. Um, it's his event. So, <laughs> 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 so if he gets the last word, no, I'm messing with you. It's our event. Thanks for having us here. And I think you've added a, 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 nice, ooh, a nice topping for the tension. <laughs> so there was tension that I was just sitting there, and now there's like a little icing of more tension. And so, folks, really the challenge we want to leave you with is conversations are worth having. Yeah. Let's not be lazy with our rhetoric. Let's not be lazy with our analysis of situations. Let's not be quick to call, um, to, 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 you know, to, let's not be zero-sum focused. Let's not be binary-minded, you know. Let us approach our ecosystem like the thing that needs to last us, hang on, not just our lives, but the generations to come. And if we're to do that, we're going to need to be mindful of the stories we tell and the stories we permit to be told about us and the economic impact they have on our lives today and in the future. With that said, please help me thank one last time this incredible panel. Keep it going for yourselves. Keep it going for yourselves. Thank you so much. It was full of insight. Thank you. So in two minutes, we're going to start the next panel. Thank you.